Are we good? Uh, yeah. So, okay. So, uh, welcome everyone to the first of our uh, new series of lunch talks. Um, and it's a real pleasure to have as our first speaker today, Katie Rodriguez Wimbley. Uh, Katie is a grad student, um, an NSF graduate research fellow at UC Irvine, um, where her research is focused on understanding ultra-faint dwarf galaxies, um, how they form stars, how they stop forming stars, um, their dynamics, and uh, everything else about them. Um, and uh, she had some very good news this week that she was awarded an NSF Ascending Postdoctoral Research Fellowship, where, which she'll be taking to UC Riverside to work with Laura Salas. So we shall congratulate her on that. And uh, with that, I'll hand it over to you, Katie. Go ahead. Awesome. Thank you all so much for having me. Um, I'm super excited to, I guess, start off the talk series for the academic year. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk, be talking all about ultra faint dwarf galaxies, um, focusing on their star formation quenching, kind of what we can tell, um, how we can use them to, to learn more about ourselves, the Milky Way, and then kind of starting to look at their evolutionary history. So all of this, um, at least for me, I'm starting to kind of focus on how we can use the ultra faints to kind of look back in time. So it's the basic idea of near field cosmology, what using what we see very nearby or today to talk about the very early universe. And one of, I think the biggest, not issues with this, but things that we need to kind of clarify from the get go, um, there we are, is which of our ultra faints are true relics. And what I mean by true relic is um, how pristine it is, it, you know, how much an ultra faint has interacted with more massive galaxies throughout its history. What would be perfect is if we could find um, lonely ultra faints so that, you know, they've really just been doing their own thing since since the get-go. And <clears throat> one of the really difficult things is the vast majority of the ultra faints we see are satellites of the Milky Way. So they are not lonely. Um, but we have seen, and, and we've known this for a while, that all of our ultra faints have, or the majority of our ultra faints have very ancient stellar populations. So you can see in the star formation histories um, of these six satellites from that Tom Brown looked at in 2014, the vast majority of them had their star formation shut off. Um, about 10 and a half billion years ago. Um, so this kind of points to this picture that on the smallest mass scales, um, star formation was kind of universally quenched during the reionization epoch. But if we look at these same six systems in a slightly different view, um, it can point towards uh, environmental quenching or the fact that maybe the Milky Way was the one who shut off the, its star formation. So the left-hand figure um, shows those six ultra faints in phase space, so radial to um, galactocentric distance. And then the right-hand plot is a figure from um, Miguel Roca in 2012, where he looked at um, kind of the phase space distribution of subhalos in the Via Lactea 2 simulation. So these are dark matter only. And you can tell there's kind of this like inner cone of subhalos that fell in a long time ago, a very early cosmic times. And so this actually correlates with the six satellites that we are looking at in our, in our brown sample. Um, so even though they all shut off their star formation a long time ago, this is showing that they could have done so because of the Milky Way's environment. So what I did um, was use dark matter only simulations. I used Elvis, the um, exploring the local volume in simulations to kind of try to figure out how long our ultra faints have been satellites of the Milky Way. So was there time for the Milky Way's environment to affect these um, ultra faints? And here's a nice little animation of Elvis. So Elvis has 
um, 12 pairs of dark of um, local group like systems. So, uh, you know, M31 and the Milky Way. And then there's 24 isolated simulations. So what I did was um, I went in and 10,000 times I randomly grabbed um, small sets or small sub halos, six per set. Um, so randomly grab six, 10,000 times. Um, and this is to mimic brown sample. And I, for each of those sets, I measure the probability that the whole set of six was accreted by a certain redshift. And so this kind of gave me the answer of, have they been in long enough for the Milky Way to have quenched their star formation? I also played around with those parameters a little bit. We know there's more than six ultrafaint satellites. So I increased that um, sample size. And I also played around with what percent of um, the sample size had to be accreted by whatever given redshift. So this is a little bit easier to see in the results plot here. There we go. Um, so what we have here is on the vertical line, um, that's my probability. So what's the likelihood that all, all six or the entire sample was accreted by what redshift, which is um, time on the horizontal axis. This aqua line is the infall based off the infall time for the last time the subhalo or the subhalo set fell into the Milky Way. But we do know that some of our systems probably fell in with like the large uh, Magellanic cloud. And so I also looked at pre-processing infall time. And Josh, you have a question. Um, yeah, so um, the procedure you've described where you're uh, selecting six subhalos randomly from Elvis, so that presumes that uh, an ultra faint can occupy any Elvis subhalo without any preference. So were there any? Sorry. Yes, there was. Um, there was no like matching between subhalos and, and ultra faints, but I did look at only those between um, like sick with V peaks of about six to 14 or 20. Um, I played with that a little bit, but yeah, I did constrain it to the smaller sub halos. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Um, and so what we get with this is that looking at our small sub halos, um, there is a vanishingly small chance that even by redshift of one, um, all six of the, the group fell in. So the Milky Way did not have time to quench their star formation and create these 10 giga year old uh, populations that we see. So this allows me to kind of add to this big picture of satellite quenching time scales, um, where there's been a great work done um, on the classical, you know, some more massive dwarfs and then much more massive uh, satellite systems. And I can say, because of this vanishingly small chance that uh, the systems are created early, um, the, on the smallest scales, it's likely that the star formation was shut off in our ultra faints um, during the reionization epoch. But as you can see with this, um, I can add to it, but we don't have very much detailed information. Um, so I was excited that I was able to work with Sean Fillingham, who was a grad student at UCI. He's now a postdoc at University of Washington to kind of constrain better, give a little more um, detail to the quenching timescales of all of our satellites, but particularly our ultra -fans. So. With this, um, Sean used Fat Elvis, which I'm gonna talk about more in a little bit. But um, the way he actually did uh, observed system to simulated system, simulated subhalo um, matching, and he did that through binding energy. So this is kind of the same idea um, that was shown in the Miguel Rocas plot from 2012. 
in the phase space that depending where you are in phase space, it has to do with when you fell in. Um, so we can match binding energy, observed binding energy to the simulated binding energy to kind of populate sub halos with observed systems. And then we're using the star formation histories to um, kind of infer quenching time or how long it took these systems to stop forming new stars. So as you can see, um, all of our ultra faints, which are these darker circles here, um, they're not on that one-to-one -one line. They all quenched much uh, earlier before they became system or satellites of the Milky Way. And so going back to our big picture of quenching timescales, um, we can add detail to it where now we have all of our ultra faints here and able to kind of maybe put a little bit more constraint on how long it took them to stop forming new stars. We can then in the future start to look at why they did that or, or what caused that. Um, and then from this work as well, there's a, some outliers compared to uh, Sean's previous work that he did with the classical dwarves in 2015. And one thing that we knew with all of this going in is that um, quenching timescales in fall time, all of this sort of thing does have dependence on the mass of the host or the mass of the Milky Way. And uh, Andrew Wetzel started looking at this in 2013, where with the really massive satellites, he looked at different how their quenching timescale was impacted by the mass of the host. Um, dark matter halo. And so you can see that here. Um, and when we look at fat Elvis and compare that to um, kinematics of the observed satellites that we see today of 44 of them, um, you can see just in this kind of combined phase space diagram that th that is true. There's, there's uh, different host mass ranges represent at least in the simulations, represent our um, observed, observed population differently. So Fat Elvis has 12 isolated hosts that have an additional um, gravitational potential embedded in them. When we look at all 12 together, um, you can see the hottest uh, systems, observed satellites, are okay represented, it's not great. Um, but then if we break down the 12 uh, hosts into three groups, so the four least massive, four intermediate, and the four most massive host halos, um, they all kind of represent what we see today differently. Um, the low mass isn't, doesn't get at the hottest very well. The high mass isn't representing the coldest systems very well. Um, and then, you know, the intermediate is there. And so kind of with this, we thought, well, if we take these comparisons a little bit further, we can constrain the mass of the Milky Way um, by using, you know, observed kinematics from Gaia and these new uh, dark matter only simulation. So we're specifically, I specifically used um, the face space information for 44 of the Milky Way satellites. Um, from McConaughey and Venn uh, last year using EDR3 data, and then Fat Elvis. So let me finally, <laughs> I've mentioned it like four times, I'll go into what Fat Elvis is a little bit more. Um, so there's 24 simulated Milky Way-like hosts in Fat Elvis. 12 of them are dark matter only. 12 of them have an embedded disk potential, which is kind of supposed to mimic the additional gravity that you get inside of a system because of all of the baryons. Um, so when you look at a dark matter only host and a disk embedded host from far out, which is that this top um, row here, they basically are the same. You can't really tell the difference, but it's when you zoom in, when you get towards the center of the host halo that you see the additional um, destruction of subhalos caused by that embedded disk potential. And so that's here. The um, disk simulated disk systems have fewer subhalos 
um, in the inner regions of the host halo than the dark matter only. And this is shown in, in Tyler's paper um, to be more representative of what we see, at least in the Milky Way. So using these, um, as I kind of briefly mentioned earlier, we wanted to constrain the mass of the Milky Way. And so we split up the 12 um, simulated hosts into the three host mass bins. So you have a little less, the four smallest hosts are all a little less than uh, one times 10 to the 12. And um, the intermediate mass range is about one to 1 1.2. And then the high mass hosts are all about 1 1.4, 1 1.5 um, and larger in solar mass. So um, now we have three sets of hosts that all have their own subhalos in them. And the way that I did kind of the comparison or the matching between simulations and observations in this work um, was to do distance matching. So for every satellite galaxy, um, I took its galactocentric distance. And then in each of our host halo sets, um, I looked at a 10 kpc window around that. So if this is the satellite galaxy, you have a little 10 kpc window um, in distance around that, that satellite. And I collected up all of the subhalos in that window. And then I randomly selected um, 10 subhalos from that 10 kpc window and called those matching to the satellite that is at the center of that distance bin. So for this, it's only distance matching. It was kind of to alleviate completeness concerns. I didn't do any mass matching. So I, you know, there, there may be some issues there. Um, but what I did after that, after I had my distance match subhalos, is then looked at uh, the velocity distribution. So phase space information. Um, comparing our simulations to the observations to see which set of or which, which host mass range the um, observations prefer. And so this is just to kind of, kind of um, illustrate the results of those distance mat that distance matching kind of method. Um, these kind of transparent lines are the full distribution. So all of the subhalos in the four least massive, four intermediate, and four most massive host halos. And then the black line that you can just barely see peeking out between those opaque colored lines um, is the distribution of the 44 Milky Way satellites using uh, the Gaia data. And then those distance matched um, samples. So each of the opaque colored lines has 440 subhalos in it where each group of 10 is matched to one of the Milky Way satellites. So we have a nice, um, you can visually see a very tight correlation here. I did use the Man Whitney U test um, to look at, to give some statistics to how well matched they are. Um, but these resulting, you know, with, I used the Man Whitney U test and the p value associated with that. Um, but with p-values, you can only say that two system or two distributions are not the same if the resulting p-value is below a specific significance limit. All of these are above our significance limit, which is great, but I, because it's above, I can't say that it's a tight distribution based on the p-values. I can say that visually though. So um, we have our nice distance match sets with now we can compare um, the velocities, as I mentioned earlier. So we set our significance limit to 0 0.05. So again, if the resulting p-value is less than 0 0.05, the two sets are not drawn from the same population. Um, so this would mean if one of the sets of subhalos from one of the sets of host halos is uh, below this 0.05 limit, then those subhalos 
do not represent, or the kinematics of those subhalos do not represent the um, observed system very well. And as you can see here, when we look at our 44 um, Milky Way satellites, there's kind of no conclusive preference for um, which host mass range well represents the observations. Um, in radial velocity, you have the low and high um, host masses rejected. In tangential, you have medium and high. And then in total velocity, all three systems are, uh, all three sets are rejected. They all have p-values lower than 0 0.05. So there's no clear preference here as to um, which sets of host halos do not match our, our observations well and which ones do. But one thing that I didn't talk about um, earlier is that the proper motions from Gaia, um, while they're amazing and great, some of them have very large errors and these can, can introduce some biases. So some of the proper motions have just proportionally large errors. This is gonna translate into proportionately large um, tangential velocity errors. And one thing that was a little surprising is that actually the systems that do have these proportionally large tangential velocity errors actually come from lower tangential velocity systems. Um, so they're, they're colder systems, which are not well represented by the higher mass halos, um, host halos. And so this could be biasing um, including these systems in the analysis could be biasing against those high high mass halos. So to address the bias, um, I excluded systems, I excluded satellites that have a um, tangential velocity error to their actual tangential velocity of uh, greater than 0.3. So I kept anything less than 0.3. Um, I ended up excluding 10 systems. So now with a set of 34 satellites um, that have more well-constrained errors, both in, in, um, both in proper motion and in total and tangential velocity, I can redo the whole comparison, the distance matching, and then um, comparing with the three um, velocity components. And now, as you can see here, um, all across all three velocity components, the low mass, uh, resulting low mass p values are all below 0 0.05, as are the high uh, high mass host p values, all below 0 0.05. So we have this nice kind of conclusive preference that the intermediate mass uh, Milky Way halos are the best representation of our satellite systems. Um, so this kind of allowed us to then look further into um, orbital parameters and see if there are other ways to kind of, um, are there more host mass diagnostics basically? Are there different ways that we can look at what host mass um, from our satellites? So this is actually information from GALPI. Um, I used, uh, you know, Milky Way potentials um, that are the median uh, or the average of the three host mass sets that I was looking at in Fat Elvis. So a little less than um, one times ten to the twelve for the low mass, about one point one for intermediate mass, which was the preferred and then greater than 1.5 for the um, high mass hosts. I also split the set of 34 satellites into two. So all of the satellites um, outside of 70 kiloparsecs and all of the satellites inside of 70 kiloparsecs. Um, and I looked at, you know, if we're gonna look at distance against orbital velocity, are we seeing any trends that can kind of tease out what the preferred host mass is. And they're colored by um, this kind of 
velocity ratio, so radial to tangential velocity to see if that's another way because getting uh, orbital eccentricity is, is difficult. It's much more straightforward to get the, well, I don't know how much more straightforward, but we have uh, radial and tangential velocities. And this ratio, um, if you have a higher ratio, you have more radial velocity. So you're probably more circular compared to um, a lower ratio, which is on a more plunging orbit. But um, when we're kind of dissecting what's going on in these two figures, there is a slight trend um, inside in the inner regions and in, you know, 70-ish kiloparsecs um, where the more circular orbits, you see more circular orbits in larger dark matter halos. So that may be a way to kind of get at, if you can figure out what the orbits are close in, that can start to tell you about um, the mass or at least you know somewhat of the mass range of that host halo. But on the outskirts, and so for, mo not the outskirts, but for most of um, the virial radius, there is no trend. <laughs> so out past 70 kpc, we don't really see uh, any trend at all with distance and uh, orbit. But in the inside, we do see a little bit where you get more circular orbits um, in more massive host halos. And then one other thing um, that we wanted to revisit was info. <laughs> um, and as you can see here, it wasn't it wasn't a very successful trip back looking at info. So now um, I'm comparing Sean's work that I talked about earlier um, with these distance matched subhalos. So Sean saw that a lot of the when he matched based on binding energy, a lot of the systems are falling in um, earlier in cosmic time, where now if I'm just matching on distance um, and you know randomly selecting 10 sub subhalos out of each bin, the, um, the distributions of infall is skewed much later than compared to Sean's work. Um, so this is kind of for, for future things to do is, is we're wondering how much of this is just caused by how you're selecting or how you're matching um, dark matter halos and, and observed systems and, and what the issues are there. Um, and one thing uh, that we knew would be kind of a, something we wanted to look into more with Fat Elvis, so Fat Elvis only has, across all 12 of the disk systems, only has two subhalos that could house an LMC. Um, and these are in the high mass hosts. So if we know we have, um, you know, we have the Magellanic system, um, we know that at least some of our ultra faints came in with that system. So how much, uh, how much of our work or analysis is affected by these kind of differing systems that came in with the LMC. So how I addressed this was by um, rerunning the analysis, excluding systems that came in with the LMC or even interacted with the LMC so that we kind of have this pure set of um, Milky Way-like affected systems instead of satellites that had been affected by any of them, uh, either of the Magellanic clouds. So we used um, Ekta Patel's work from last year. She found there's um, four satellites, four Milky Way satellites that came in with the uh, Magellanic system, um, two that had been recently captured, and then another three that have had um, enough prior interactions with the system to affect, you know, their kinematics today. And so when, again, redoing the analysis, the distance matching, and then comparison, um, we get this nice little result that the LMC satellites 
do not affect our results. Um, again, the resulting p-values from the Man Whitney U test uh, reject the comparison between the low mass and high mass hosts. So the four that, or the host range that best represents the observed data is again, the intermediate mass range, um, which is one, about one to 1 1.2 times 10 to the 12. So that's a nice, um, fairly robust constraint now on the Milky Way's dark matter halo. And um, so now I'm actually continuing to work with LMC satellites. I've started and I'm pretty well through a project um, with Alex G who just left y'all to be a professor at University of Chicago. Um, I'm looking at uh, the chemical abundances in Hydrus one. And what I'm really excited to do with these abundances is to see um, how we can get at the uh, hydrus's like evolutionary history and kind of um, any ultrafaint in general as we start to kind of put down methods and start figure out trends of um, what we're seeing in our ultrafaints. So with hydrus, um, Alex was able to observe 11 stars, um, 11 member stars. Two, three of them he observed with Mike, eight he observed with M2FS. Um, I've done the data reduction for all of them, and I have some preliminary results, very preliminary, but <laughs> preliminary results for the three Mike uh, observed Hydra stars. And what's exciting, um, so as you can see in this figure, the red circles are our three Hydra stars. Um, there is a negative trend in their magnesium to calcium ratio uh, as you increase in metallicity, um, which is also seen in Carina two and three. Carina two and three are two of the other um, two of the four long-term um, Magellanic systems. So Hydrus, I'm now able to kind of add to that and say maybe, well, at least three of the four um, Magellanic systems have this negative trend in magnesium to calcium. So we can, you know, start to kind of figure out why that is and if the Magellanic system had anything to do with this negative trend that we're seeing. Um, these are preliminary because the stellar parameters uh, that we use to derive these chemical abundances are spectroscopic only, um, while what the goal is and what we'll be doing in the end is using um, spectroscopic and photometrically derived stellar parameters to then get at the chemical abundances. Um, so, so far within the project, um, I have successfully implemented a kind of update to the M2FS reduction pipeline. I implemented um, a coherent point drift algorithm. So there's some of the arcs from the um, observations that were literally just like shifted ever so slightly. Uh, so we were able, I was able to put in this um, algorithm that'll kind of put everything back in place um, so that so the data will reduce nicely and quickly and correctly. Um, and so I'm finishing up the reduction uh, and analysis of the eight stars that were observed, that Alex observed with M2FS. Um, and then for all of them, we'll do this kind of stellar parameter combination where we're deriving those spectroscopically and photometrically. And then we will also use equivalent widths and spectral uh, synthesis to get at our chemical abundances. So. Hopefully that'll be done soon. Stay tuned for that work. And as a follow-up to that, um, as Andrew, Andrew mentioned, I'm going to be starting a postdoc. Um, I'll actually start in January working with Laura Salas as an NSF fellow. And I've proposed, it's a three-year postdoc. Um, I, so I did the kind of three-year, three one-year project um, proposal. What I'm really excited to start on kind of right away is continuing this chemical abundances of ultrafaints, but focus shifting the focus 
from LMC satellites to non-LMC um, ultrafaints to see if like that, you know, that magnesium to calcium trend is not there. What other differences are there in the chemistries of the um, LMC versus non-LMC ultrafaints? And then start to get at um, how their history has impacted those um, chemical different trends. So I'm going to do that observationally. One of my other projects that I um, proposed is, again, another uh, observation to simulation comparison. But there is some recent work done by Eric Bell and Richard D'Souza showing that um, binding energy to current today, I guess, binding energies for subhalos are actually affected by um, the kind of infall um, situation of that subhalo. So did the subhalo fall in by itself or did it fall in with a group? And you can start to kind of figure that out by examining the um, binding energy more. And you can see that in this figure here, all of these purple dots um, are in a group centered around this slightly more massive uh, blue subhalo, and then the green are isolated subhalos. And just, you know, two gig years later from the kind of start of infall, you can start to see um, even just distance wise, some trends in which systems were um, originally in the group and which were originally isolated. And so I would like to do this kind of work, but focusing on the ultra faints um, to again see if there's maybe some kinematic signatures that we can start to, that we can use to start to pin down um, which of the ultra faints are pristine or, or you know, have never interacted with a more massive system before. And the last project that I am really excited to work on is um, using fire, so hydrodynamic simulations to look at how metals have been polluted into the ultra faints and specifically what are the differences in that pollution um, based on you know various types of ultra faints or so ultra faints in various environments um, probably specifically ones of um, that were originally milky way or ultra sorry ones that were originally um, Magellanic cloud satellites versus those that maybe are field systems or um, Milky Way satellites only. Um, yeah, so those are my proposed works that I'm really excited to get going on in January. And um, that's it for now. Thanks so much. And I'll take whatever questions you have. Great, thank you, Katie. Um, and we do have plenty of time for questions if people have them. Yeah. Uh, let's see, I see you found you. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, so I guess I have two questions. Uh, you you yeah. uh, discussed the three uh, mass bins of the Milky Way, but how about the Milky Way's concentration and halo shape? Uh, are the satellite kinematics also sensitive to those parameters? Uh, uh, that's one. Uh, another is yeah. uh, so. Uh, would, would halo stars help to tighten the constraints? Oh, but your second question is really interesting. Um, for your first question, uh, we did not look at um, concentration or yeah, halo shape. Um, the I'm trying to remember in in Fat Elvis. I know that you know they don't specifically say this is it. This is the the concentration exactly. I think they're all fairly close together. Um, but we did not look at that, and it would be interesting, yeah, to see how the how the shape or concentration affects the mass. Um, and then with the halo stars, um, I think it could if we expanded the work more. The, the halo stars or the, the kinematics of the halo stars could be really interesting to look at there and even globular clusters. I know there's been some work lately 
using globulars to to constrain the um, yeah. mass in the Milky Way. Yeah, but it would be, I think for the most part, many of the previous work um, has some overlap. So they're the mass constraints that they uh, come with, come up with, um, have overlap with our kind of intermediate range. I think ours is slightly tighter than what many other results have gotten. Yeah, I, I, I guess intuitively uh, the halo, uh, the, the satellites, halo stars, and the globulars set, like sample different regimes, uh, like halocentric distances. So for the total mass, yeah. the the satellites uh, 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 like the obvious choice. But like if uh, going back to my first question, if concentration or the inner halo shape is also uh, among your targets that you want to constrain, then maybe uh, halo stars are helpful. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Cool. I totally yes. agree. Yeah, thank you. Let's see, uh, Ethan, you had a question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks, Katie. It was a really awesome talk. Um, I think I, I think I also have two questions, and Feng Zhao partly cool. asked my first one, but I'll ask the, like the second half of it, which is um, even just in terms of halo mass, I was wondering about the choice to like bin the simulated sample into you know like three categories like how much scatter mm. is there in like the test statistics you calculate like within each bin and could some yeah. of the additional variants be explained by like mass accretion history things like this yeah so um we didn't i looked at and this was actually josh's suggestion so thank you <laughs> i looked at kind of the scatter in that middle bin I didn't really look at, at the two outer bends. Um, I had originally looked at like, instead of grouping them by four hosts, grouping them by three. Um, but the if you look at like kind of the mass distribution um, of all 12 hosts, group grouping them and doing three groups made slightly more sense just based on like how the the Vero masses today are grouped if you you know look at like a histogram of them basically. Um, but within the intermediate mass range, if I expand that mass range a little bit, um, that preference goes away. So there, and then and then if I tighten it up more, um, it stays constant. So there's you know if I look at um, the three intermediate host masses and compare instead of the four intermediate hosts, um, there's still the preference for um, that, that mass range. So we could get it a little tighter, but I think to be, I don't know, maybe more robust because the four matched well, that's what we kind of went with as our results. That makes sense. Cool. I see. Thanks. Yeah, that's really helpful. I have another question, but Anna has her hand up and I should stop talking. I can go ahead. Okay, I can ask my question. Uh, it maybe, well, doesn't really directly tie into like, Ethan's question, but but in the sense uh, uh, of the of the bins you use to um, to study the uh, the circularity of orbits, and so when you divided mm -hmm. them in kind of near nearby and, and far away satellites, um, yeah. it was um, really interesting if, um, that there is some correlation with mass and and kind of the presence of uh, circular orbits in the inner galaxy. And so I was wondering how would that um, like if you could if you re removed the the two bins, like is there a mm. maybe specific radius at which you you don't see the kind of the lack of those radial orbits, and if maybe that will uh, give you maybe a finer um, precision in estimating the mass of the Milky Way. In that sense. Oh yeah, that's really interesting. Um, so so we picked seventy. Um, kind of just because there there is a nice hole there in the observed satellite sample if that makes sense um but there's not i mean that would be interesting i think that would be interesting to look at because um in that outside of 70 sample um there's not really a trend and it's 
it's kind of, it's not just number wise. It's like, you know, this one will show that same kind of orbit, uh, eccentricity trend, but the next closest one won't. And then one, you know, just, just 10 kiloparsecs further away shows it again. Um, so in that, um, further distance bin, it's just messier. Whereas as on, in the inner bin, um, you kind of have the, the general trend, you see it and you see it kind of get stronger the closer in you get. Um, but it would be, yeah, it would be really interesting to look at that again and make sure that, that what I'm remembering is correct. Sounds good, thanks. Yeah, thank you then. All right, do we have any other questions? I can ask my other one if there aren't any, but I feel sure. Bad. Go for it. Yeah. Uh, okay. So um, the, the other thing I was, I guess this is a little bit more open ended than my other question, but I was wondering about this distance matching procedure um, to select the analogs of the observed satellites. And I guess in particular, what I'm wondering is um, if we insist that like the luminosity function of those distance matched subhalos matches the observed sample. Like, what is the kind of galaxy halo connection we would infer? Like, do there have to be a lot of subhalos that are not populated with observable satellites? And I guess what I'm asking is partly related to Josh's question in the sense of like, once we think about the selection effects, is it sort of like a consistent story? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So I think, yes, or at least, um, I don't know if it's a consistent story, but I think that doing it this way is kind of saying that there are many subhalos that are not um, populated. So one of the things that I look at, and this is in the, the paper um, that j just came out on archive today, um, is different uh, peak velocity limits for what dark matter halos can, you know, house a galaxy. Um, so for all of the plots that I showed, um, all of those subhalos have a V peak of six or greater, which is actually fairly low, I think, compared to um, what has been thought of as, as um, you know, big enough to be able to, to keep all of the baryons inside. Um, I did look at like a limb, you know, a 10 when I set the that lower limit to 20, which has kind of been, I think for a while that was like the canonical value is you have to have a V peak of at least 20 um, for the ultra faints in those distance bins across all 12 of the hosts, there's just not enough subhalos. Like you don't have enough to do that kind of matching. So I can't even I can't even run the analysis to see if there's a preference because I'm not able to um, collect up enough subhalos to really do that. Unless you, you're looking at a really massive subhalo, you know, to the tiniest ultra faint. Um, when I lower it to 10 and exclude the uh, LMC satellites, I can run the analysis. The result isn't conclusive. that you get like robust numbers and everything. So I don't know now that I'm thinking about it, if that's actually answering your question. Um, but yeah, I think that a distance matching, um, I liked because we're kind of getting away from the, the issue of scatter at the low end of that kind of abundance matching um, method, but but I do think it kind of is, is showing that there's a lot of systems, a lot of subhalos that wouldn't have anything in them. Yeah, I think it's really interesting to consider. I have a lot of follow-up questions, but anyway, I'm gonna to talk to you at four, so. Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> and it looks like Fengzhou, you have another question? Yeah, so just a, a little bit following up my uh, earlier questions. So, uh, so I mentioned Milky Way mass, concentration, and shape. Right? I just wonder if um, there could be uh, like a degeneracies among, among these factors. Um, uh, 
And uh, I guess one way to to uh, to to check this uh, with your current uh, results or data already is to see if there is any difference between the the uh, the fat Elvis sample with the disk potential and uh, uh, versus the like the control sample. Oh, the dark matter. The yeah. ones, like the halos round there, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I haven't. I didn't run the analysis with dark matter only. Um, but I definitely like I could, and that would be pretty easy. Um, one thing that I did look at, you know, dark matter versus versus disc is that um, first figure, if I can get to it, um, I don't know if I can, maybe I can. Um, in, yeah, in this one, um, so these are the disc hosts, I did this same thing with dark matter only, and the dark matter only um, is much worse at representing the systems, um, especially these that are close in. Um, so that, yeah, that could be a, a, a starting point to look at. Like you were saying, the, the, that'll show the mm -hmm. differences in the concentration, right, because of the Yes, yeah, so the variants have two two effects here, right? So make the halo rounder and makes the halo more concentrated. Uh, yeah. yeah. So yeah, interesting. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anna, you have another question? Yeah, can I ask like one more? Um, of course. Yeah, kind of. A, yeah, going back to the the very beginning when you mentioned that you wanted to identify these pristine galaxies and kind of that have been like least uh, affected. Um, and you're starting your new uh, position in January and you'll have access to CAC. So sort of what is your target list based on all of all of these kind of which are the, the first galaxies that uh, you're excited to follow up and see what, uh, yeah, they're indeed the, the pristine ones. Yeah, um, so uh, I definitely think one of them that I will, I'm gonna look into more because I, I do wanna put, put a proposal in for, um, the Keck 2022A uh, observing run or semester um, would be Wilman 1. So this is uh, not an LMC satellite. Um, and I was actually talking with Josh earlier about this and it, it does, there is some um, metallicity information on it, but uh, it's so far from what I can tell, I, I looked into it a little bit more. Um, there's not like this kind of detailed chemical abundance as there are for the, the LMC satellites. So that's one of them that I'm excited to look at or propose for time to look at. But yeah, so I think what I'm, because um, so many of the ultra faints were discovered with DES, I'll have to, and, but, and that's in the South, I'll have to uh, look more, start by figuring out which ones were not discovered in DES. And those may have, I may have a better opportunity of looking at them with Keck. Right. And based on like the, these figures, like does it lie in, in any specific part of this parameter space where uh, that makes you think it's, uh, it's more kind of primordial, more pristine? Um, you know, I haven't looked into that relationship yet, but it's definitely something I want to look into. Um, the LNC satellites uh, are kind of, oh, Oh, sorry. <laughs> They're kind of spread throughout this the mm. this kind of phase space diagram, yeah. Um, but I don't know if if there's even differences in there that we may be able to kind of pin down. Um, most of the LFC satellites uh, actually um, do have those lower tangential velocity errors, so we're able to like. Mm -hmm get, okay, I guess, more constrained information on them. So, but yeah, I definitely, as I get, as more information comes in about the non-LMC, um, I wanna see if there's, yeah, trends in the phase space as well. Very exciting, thanks. Good yeah, luck. thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, I'm not seeing any more questions. In that case, let's uh, all thank Katie and thank you everyone for joining us today. Yeah, thank you so much, everybody. Thank Having you. A really nice talk. Yep. Yeah.
All right. Um, and you have a couple more uh, meetings scheduled, I think, right? Yes. That's right. Yes. Okay. I think I have one right now at three. Perfect. Right? Yes, I do. A couple more. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Thanks so again. much. It was a really again. nice talk. Sure. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Bye. Talk to you soon. Bye.